I tell you what, it's, it's not, not like, like the old olden days. days. I'm Jake. I'm Rosie. And this is our podcast centred around Art Attack and How To. And we'll be talking about some other associated shows as well. For much of the 90s, Neil Buchanan was, in many ways, Mr. CITV, as he was referred to at times by people like the voiceover announcer on CITV from 1993 to 1998, which is when Neil was on CITV a lot. And indeed, I think there was a time, probably in a summer term, when they used to have a lot of repeats on, that Neil was on CITV every day of the week. It was something like Animal Crazy on Monday, Finders Keepers on Tuesday, Art Attack on Wednesday, It's a Mystery on Thursday, and Zap on Friday. Of course, in Zap he played Smart Arty, which indeed makes a lot of sense, because before he was a TV presenter, Neil Buchanan was an artist. And indeed still is an artist, as his website makes very clear that that's still his big ruling passion. So it makes a lot of sense that the first show he did present for CITV, and he was presenting all the time that he presented the other ones, during and after, was Art Attack, which ran on CITV from 1990 to 2007. And it was really at that point in 2007 that CITV wasn't making new shows at all, or hardly at all. And Art Attack ended up on Sunday morning, which was about the only time slot they had left. And I was wondering how many series of Art Attack there actually are while watching some through on YouTube. And it turns out there were actually 19 series. And it was the main art show we used to watch, mainly because of Neil Buchanan, I'm sure. And like many shows that do go on for a long time, I think it did start to struggle for material. I think our mum said at one point, all he ever does is cover things in PVA glue and newspaper and paint them as different models, and in many ways she was right. You can't actually find an episode of Art Attack where Neil doesn't use PVA glue in some way, and that's why it became known as Art Attack Glue, by PVA glue with as seen on Art Attack written on the bottle. When we used to watch it most religiously, I think it had a definite format for each episode where he would start with one of those papier mache things and then he would do his big art attack. And I think by that time, when he was out in parks and airfields and skating rinks and things, he was really channeling Smart Arty with his little sketches and voiceovers of kind of expressions and noises and, ah, mm, that kind of thing. Yes, it was really reminding me of Zap those lead-ins to the big art attack when I was watching them through on YouTube. And it's actually possible to hear how Neil Buchanan also did the voice of Daisy, Daisy Dares You on Zap, as some of the little characterizations he's doing in the lead-ups to the big art attack sound very like Daisy. And in many ways, I think the big art attack was the USP of the show. In other ways, it was very similar to other art shows. After the big art attack, he would generally do a tip one I remember is making things look shiny, 3D, like balloons and things like that, window two teardrops. And when I see snooker balls with the studio lights reflecting off them, it always reminds me of Neil's drawings of that sort of thing. I think that's the most interesting section of the show in many ways. When I was watching them on YouTube, I was finding those bits most interesting and the most useful for actual aspiring artists, people wanting to improve their art skills by watching it. Another one I remember is creating movement with lines and flicks and things. And that really is where he gets the chance to show off what a brilliant artist he is. He created some absolutely wonderful effects, layering on different bits of shading and shadow to make this kind of moody cityscape with realistic water, for example. Excellent stuff. Then what he did last was something inspired by or linking to a piece of work from one of the viewers, be it someone from the schools that used to come up and say, Hi, I'm David, I've made a picture of... Or something from the Art Attack scrapbook or gallery. And Neil will say, Ah, oh, that's a brilliant idea. And you know what? It's inspired me to create... And then whatever it is, a pop-up card, something like that, something small to make. And yes, that structure did work particularly well, and we did watch it very religiously. 
I remember rushing home, having stayed a little late at school to practice for my GCSE drama practical in mid-1999, thinking, oh, I've got to get home in time for Art Attack, even though I never particularly liked art, and that's all thanks to Neil. Neil is very engaging and makes it very fun, and it's good to see his pictures. He's a fantastic artist. I actually did GCSE art and was quite interested in art and may have used some of his tips and tricks. Although there were some things he did that the rather stuffy old head of art from the very old school of teaching would say were wrong, such as blurring your chalk. And I thought, what the heck, everybody blurs their chalk to create effects of lights and things. But perhaps proper artists, as it were, don't quite agree with Neil. But I thought he was excellent and certainly his tips are very good and very useful for children. Neil mentioned at times how he didn't get on too well at art in school, and sometimes he'd do like a little caricature of a teacher and say, oh, this is my old art teacher, if he's making like a moving mouth for it or something, make it say, you'll never amount to anything, Buchanan, uh, what does he know? I did particularly used to enjoy the big art attacks, and there are certain types of big art attack some of which would go, oh no, not one of those, just shaking out some salt on a black studio floor isn't as good as getting hockey sticks and jumpers and helmets and gym mats and all that kind of thing and making a big gigantic picture with those out on the parkland or something like I was remembering earlier. But then the very lowest of the low with big art attacks was just a mural, wasn't it? I was always very disappointed when he just painted a mural. And indeed, a big part of the USP of the Big Art Attack is that you look down on it with the bird's eye view, and Neil looks up and spreads his arm. I remember one I saw him doing on YouTube was not the bird's eye view, but it was on a sort of wire mesh in front of him, using some cool dude clothes to create, like, this skateboard gang or something. And I thought, well, that's better than just painting a mural, Neil, but I prefer it when you can look down. And indeed, with his big art attacks out in the field, he's got a couple of different levels of difficulty, how complicated it is to make them. Sometimes he'll just have the grass as the background, which of course is fair enough. Sometimes he'll make a big background, rolling out great sheets of fabric and making the sun and clouds and what have you. But what a lot of fantastic ideas he came up with for those big art attacks over 18 years. And on the US version of Art Attack, Neil is Big Art Attack Guy, and his Big Art Attacks, as you can probably infer from that, are a segment in the show. Yes, I did find that very interesting to read, but it made a lot of sense when Art Attack is sold to other countries. Of course, they get the presenter to redo some of Neil's Art Attacks, and maybe include some of their own, and they include his Big Art Attacks as Big Art Attack Guy, and if necessary, they redo of any of the zap-like dialogue set up. I do remember watching a documentary or something about children's television and Neil saying he came up with the idea first of giant pencils and crayons and things like that. And being used to the format that we've just described, I thought, what? Isn't they giant pencils? Well, they're all sort of in the background, but they're just set dressing. But then at one point we did get the opportunity to see some earlier ones. And what he would do was take a giant pencil or a giant crayon and make a giant version of whatever he's just done, a pop-up card or a style of picture or whatever. Not giant like a big art attack, but a pencil as tall as him and a piece of paper 10 feet by 6 feet or something like that. But he'd really stopped doing that by the time we picked it up and I suspect it was probably a bit too much trouble, wasn't it, to have working giant art equipment and do it every time. I guess it's a pretty familiar format for a very long-running show. It starts off how it thinks it's going to be. It finds a sustainable format, becomes popular with that, and then gets rather tired as it gets towards 10, 15, 20 years. And it ends and you think, oh, well, I guess I've had enough of that. One aspect of Art Attack that has been used to varying degrees of success is the character The Head. 
Now, I was very interested to discover while I was having my art attack kick towards the end of last year and doing some research that in the first two series, the head was actually an actor. One actor in series one and a different actor in series two who was made up pretending to be the head in the art gallery, the head sculpture that talked to us, the viewers, when the security guard wasn't looking in order to back up what Neil had been saying in the previous segment on the show. I'll just diverge slightly to point out another sort of bridge between segments on Art Attack was Neil doing what he called quick art attacks, quick little segments with just his hands where they run the film backwards and it looks like he's unmessing up a little painting picture and doing little things like curling paper to make a snail or something. Like that. He drew those people where, if you turn it upside down, they still look like a person, don't they? It's one face with a beard one way and another face with hair the other way. And wooden spoons with two different expressions from the same character painted on either side. And that thing where you've got a card circle and bits of string and you draw one thing on one side and another thing on the other side and then flip over the string and pull it taut and the circle spins around and round and round and round and round and it looks like one picture or maybe a little animation. I like the head, those were bearingly entertaining and successful. Something that you could try yourself at home, most of those, without further instruction. But I was a bit surprised at first to read, oh, the head used to be a real person and then they turned it into a sculpture puppet. But then I thought, well, perhaps that does make more sense, the head coming to life and it's an actual real person's head. And then they realise perhaps it'll look a bit more convincing and a bit more like an art sculpture if we actually sculpt it and turn it into a puppet. I was surprised to hear about the original head. I thought, that's not going to look like a sculpture though, is it? Obviously you need a puppet, but I guess it wasn't obvious to the creators until they tried it out the first way that they thought of. I don't know if they got a different actor for series two because they thought he was better at looking like a sculpture and evoking a sculpture. But then from series three onwards, the head was puppeted and voiced by Francis Wright, who has done so much puppeteering for CITV and elsewhere. And whether that character was entertaining really depends on how they used him. A lot of the time, particularly when we started watching, he was just making really rubbish jokes. Usually they get him to say, I've tried what Neil's done, here it is, and he's done something completely wrong and it looks awful and it's all falling to pieces. And some of those were amusing and some weren't. He would show those having recapped, summarised what we have to do in order to make our own, and then say, I've done one myself. But perhaps they realised that the more useful aspect of the head was that recap rather than making the joke, because they started having him not make a joke but actually do a quite detailed run-through of what Neil had been doing, so we really could use his instructions to do it ourselves. Another thing I was interested in on foreign art attacks is how the head is credited as the new voice actor if I was doing the voice, and Francis Wright, because obviously he was still doing the puppetry. And one piece of evidence for the fact that they didn't really always know what to do with the head and find him very sustainable is that he's not always there. He did disappear in series 12 and 13, but then he came back for four series, and then he's not in the final two series, series 18 and series 19, where it seems that they really have finally had enough of him. But the interesting thing is about his absence from series 12 and 13, that's where we got Art Attack twice weekly, where Art Attack was on twice a week on Monday and Wednesday. And I suppose one reason they stopped that, actually, was that not long afterwards, they started putting everything on five days a week on CITV anyway and getting through the series more quickly, because that's more like what they were doing on cable television. They were kind of trying to match cable and stop all the viewers going over to cable children's channel. But yes, during series 12 and 13, it was a novelty. Art Attack twice weekly, two shows a week. Wow, twice the Art Attack you were expecting, except it wasn't quite, was it? He really didn't do any more than those things that we ran through 
he did do a big art attack in each show. So there was one more big art attack, and that was really all the extra content. Yeah, I remember realising quite quickly, all you get is one extra big art attack. He left his kind of big make on a kind of cliffhanger. It's like, oh, well, I'll show you how to finish this on Wednesday. So it was a bit pointless, really, but made more demands on Neil to think of big art attacks. Even though that was his USP in many ways, and his favourite thing to do, I expect, he may have slightly ended up regretting agreeing to do twice the big art attack. So perhaps that's another reason they only had two series of art attack twice weekly. But there were other changes as we went towards the end of Art Attack, the last few series. Guest artists sometimes with little VTs showing us their particular ways of making art, like sculpture from metal and wood, which was quite interesting. And one thing they did to change the presentation was for the big make, say it was a four-part attack. And I was reminded when I was watching through them on YouTube quite recently how the concept of the four part attack is entirely arbitrary because it's just doing its normal make, however many stages it has, and they break it down into what they say are four easy parts. A four part attack. But really, a part could be anything from one thing to do to four things. For instance, one time making your base out of butter tubs and loo rolls and whatever and covering it in papier-mâché might be one part, but another time making the base might be another part and the papier-mâché a second part. So it really wasn't surprising after 2007 when Art Attack didn't come back again. But CITV weren't really making new shows then. As I say, they didn't really have their afternoon slots. I used to record new Art Attacks at 9.25 on a Sunday morning and we watch them at lunchtime. As I also said, Art Attack was the main children's art show we watched when we were young. But there were a couple of others. Of course, if you turned over to CBBC, you could often find Tony Hart doing one of his art shows, and they actually had an art show with Hart in the title. There were about four of them, from the 70s right through to the early 2000s. One was the Art Box Bunch, that was a later one. One was Smart Heart, Take Heart is another one. But the one that was on after our school days was Heartbeat in which Tony Hart and a co-host used to do art and show some of our pictures in the Heartbeat Gallery. Which brings me to one of my more disappointing childhood memories. I drew a picture for Tony Hart. I can't remember what of. It was probably a decent picture for someone my age. It was never even acknowledged, never mind shown on the programme. And for some reason, I can't remember, perhaps I found it on YouTube or something, I did watch an episode of Heartbeat as an adult, and I was reminded of this experience when it was the viewer's art section, and I noticed that all the art was really above average standard for the age or whatever child had sent it in, and Tony Hart and Gabrielle were saying, oh, isn't this one good? Oh, I really like the wind effect, or I really like the texture of the hair on this animal or something and if they didn't like anything in particular they just kept stum and you'd have to look at the picture and assess the quality of it yourself and read the name of the screen for yourself and it really struck me how different that is from Neil with his scrapbook which later became the gallery and his laptop where he would show loads of work no matter how much of a horrible mess it was no matter whether the quality seemed consistent with the age if it was above the expected level for that age below or bang on and he would always find something to say and really sound like he meant it about what the child had done well or what a clever idea it was or maybe this child has seen this artwork or this place because that's what it reminds me of and I just thought that was very nice and very genuine that Neil really appreciated the heart and soul that went into the work, which I don't think Tony Hart did. Yes, I agree. Neil could see and share with us the good it found in any horrible scribble or painty mess that had been sent to him, which probably inspired us to try our own art more than Tony Hart and his rather aloof comments on the really good art. 
I do remember Gabrielle, and I remember noticing when we were children, she's really a sculptor. Tony Hart would do 2D, and Gabrielle would make something 3D out of boxes or whatever. And then many years later, she was actually one of those artists in the segment in Art Attack that you mentioned, sculpting something out of bits of metal, I think. That's right, it must have been about 20 years after she was on Heartbeat, and we recognised her. We're like, oh, that's Gabrielle doing her sculpture. And then it says at the end with special guest Gabrielle Bradshaw. But despite those things about the elitism, Tony Hart does have the distinction of being the one person who has inspired me to create a piece of art where he drew a railway viaduct with a vanishing point, and I had a go at it myself, and it looked like absolute rubbish. But I did like the picture and wanted to have a go at it. The difference being, if Tony Hart had seen it, he probably would have spat on it, whereas Neil would have found something positive to say about it. I really like the way Jake has used the shading on the railway arches. The other art show we used to watch was Bitsa, which is very much a kind of make and do art show. And that used to be on in the weekend mornings and was presented by Caitlin Easterby, I think her name was, and Simon Pascoe. And they were a lot of fun. I think we both always felt that Bitsa wasn't really something you could come away from and really make the things from it. They used to be very complicated makes. Get the engine housing from a Boeing 747 and glue it to this Egyptian mummy. (laughs) It wasn't something you could come away and think, oh yes, I'll try it myself, as Neil always encouraged us. Try it yourself. But I don't know if Caitlin and Simon thought we were really going to try it ourselves. Some specific makes I remember include a working well where you would wind some string or something attached to a yoghurt pot down into this very complicated well that you'd made and it had all the roof and handle and everything which looked fabulous but I can't see many children being able to make that. Another one was making an authentic sort of iron age roundhouse by weaving together hundreds and hundreds of some sort of quite bendy type of stick must take days to do that a slightly less ambitious one but still not something i would fancy trying was a pen that a giant could use not quite as big as neil buchanan's giant pens but it was made out of one of those sort of big lemonade bottles or two of those painted and a fountain pen nib shape made out of card and they put the middle of a pen into it so it was a working giant's pen that the bfg could use it was fabulous but who can be bothered to try and make that and face the disappointment of it not looking like it does when Caitlin or Simon makes it. What you could do on Bitsa was try and do the little makes that Hans used to do as kind of bridges between scenes. I'm not sure if he was supposed to be a robot or a sort of embalmed zombie artist. I thought a robot when I was a child. But he used to go boom, 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 boom while making with his robotic hands little things like a little fun fake thermometer or a little thing out of a matchbox, a little magic trick, for example. And you could have a go at those at home. One thing that he did, which isn't art, it's just a fun sort of trick, is to put a bit of sellotape on a balloon and stick a pin through the sellotape and the balloon doesn't pop, and I've tried that and the balloon popped. He used to do very much the sort of things that the handyman might do on Zap, and indeed it's the same sort of thing. A person sits there, not moving their body, but doing things with their hands. The handyman used to have a longer segment and make milkshakes and things sometimes, but it's the same basic idea. And also rather like Neil's quick art attacks that we talked about. A part of the show I used to enjoy was the bit where they would have numbered boxes The child of a television and a fruit machine would supposedly randomly select a child saying Number 17! Or Number 6! Or something like that. And how many did they use? Three? Yes, I think so. Of those numbered boxes and in them would be things such as balls or smaller boxes or fiddly paper clips or something like that or just things. Many of which would relate in some way to the theme of the show in order to help them make something in three minutes, in the three-minute challenge. 
that did relate to the theme of the show. Which may suggest that the child of the television and the fruit machine wasn't really random. But I always remembered one in particular where the theme of the episode had been building and construction and that kind of thing. And Simon and Caitlin really worked separately on this one. I don't know if they always did. But I know this because by an extraordinary coincidence, it's the one example we found on YouTube when we were looking for one, the one that I always remembered. And Simon was doing what we used to really object to, using the boxes themselves in order to build, like, a tower. The boxes that the stuff would come out of. I mean, that's cheating, isn't it? I always thought that was cheating. I was interested to discover you felt the same way when we were watching that clip and discussing it. And then in the meantime, Caitlin is making a sort of yellow helmet out of card that she puts on her head and a ball on a chain, all of which is a sort of wrecking ball costume. Three minute representation of a wrecking ball. Very good. because She goes up to Simon's tower and knocks it all down. And he seemed genuinely surprised and horrified. And I did think from that it actually was all unplanned and spontaneous, even though I think their ingredients had been pre-chosen. I don't think that they knew what they were going to be or what they were going to do. I think it was quite common for them to decide quickly, right, I'll make this, you make that, and then we'll join them together to make the big model three-minute make at the end. And Simon wasn't expecting there that his contribution was going to be knocked down by Caitlin's. One thing I remember them making was a gramophone. I think it was quite tall, so probably they stacked it up on the three boxes that the things came in, which must have been rather disappointing, but I was rather impressed. They had some records in one of the boxes, they had a turntable, they made a little arm. So coming back from that divergence to Art Attack, or at least to CITV, one of the things I remembered for quite some years and managed to find on YouTube during this art attack watch through I was having was a section where the presenters of some of the CITV shows that used to be on at about 4.15 came together and made a little special where they presented a segment from each other's shows. And it was called, as it turned out, Crazy How Bad Attack because it was incorporating four shows, Animal Crazy, which was mentioned earlier, which Neil Buchanan presented with Jenny Powell, How To, which we'll talk about in some more detail in a moment, Bad Influence, which was a video game review show, and they were kind of reclaiming the phrase, oh, video games are a bad influence on children, by using it as the title of the show, and of course, Art Attack was the fourth one of those. And the thing I remembered always most from that was Carol Vorderman presenting Art Attack. Me too. I remembered that the other things had happened. Couldn't remember a damn thing about them. And when we watched that on YouTube, I think we both still felt that Carol Vorderman presenting Art Attack was the best bit of it. And it was the last bit as well, so perhaps they realised it was going to be the best and saved it for last. But it was very funny, and I think Carol did a better job than anyone else of affectionately mimicking, taking the piss gently out of another presenter. And I did remember that the thing she'd taken from Neil in his presenting style was, and there it is, and she said it all the time. I thought, does he say that? And then watching the piece of Art Attack, I think, oh yes, he does say, and there it is, quite a lot. That's what Carol had taken away. I always thought the thing he said most was, try it yourself. But if I was taking off Neil doing Art Attack, I'd say, try it yourself all the time. And Carol actually did say that at the end, but unfortunately she said, try it for yourself. And I thought, oh, Carol, that's not quite right. But still, a brilliant Neil Art Attack takeoff and very memorable. By contrast, it turned out that mimicking taking off other presenters wasn't Neil's thing at all. I thought he was trying much too hard to be funny with this impression of Gareth Jones presenting How To, but it was nothing like Gareth, so I don't know really what he was going for there. Yes, I thought the same thing. 
Another presenter on that segment was Violet Berlin, who apparently was in Bad Influence, along with Andy Crane, and another lady presenter, but we never watched Bad Influence, we weren't interested in computer games. But I did wonder if Gareth Jones and Violet Berlin had met on Crazy How Bad Attack, or really experienced each other's presenting skills for the first time, and said, hey, why don't we make our own version of How To, which they did in The Big Bang later in the 90s, which was pretty much exactly like how to, except Violet Berlin was there with Gareth. She did replace another co-presenter, but I don't know her name, I've never seen her anywhere else, and I don't think either of us actually watched that series. And the story goes that she left and they needed a replacement and Violet was working as a runner on the show already and they said, let's use Violet. And so I was a bit surprised to learn that she'd been a presenter on Bad Influence before that. It didn't sound like she'd presented before at all, but I suppose given that she had and then she was a runner on the show, that would explain why they said, oh, well, I can do it. When I sort of flicked through an episode of Bad Influence on YouTube to see what it was like, I seem to remember Violet only had a very little bit to do. It was mainly Andy Crane and this other lady. So I guess she was only sort of starting out as a presenter, and it made sense that she was a runner rather than talent like the rest of them were at that stage. The animal crazy part of Crazy How Bad Attack was awfully good. They had these very cute lion cubs which everyone was enjoying. But it seemed to me that really, for Fred Dynage at least, the whole point of Crazy How Bad Attack was to take the piss out of Andy Crane, because he did this very unflattering impression of Andy presenting bad influence in this sort of mock, cool, very embarrassing, cringy way, which you thought was a rather undue and inaccurate impression when you found Andy Crane presenting bad influence. Yes, I thought he was doing it perfectly sensibly. He wasn't trying to use the cool down of the kids lingo that I noticed, and he certainly didn't have on a silly puffer jacket and backwards baseball cap like Fred did. But Fred Dynage has certainly earned his place as one of the big icons of British children's television, because he is the mainstay of the How series. As we think of it, usually how to, because that is the version of the show that was on when we were young. And that ran almost as long as Art Attack. How to ran from 1990 to 2006 on CITV, and it was presented throughout by Fred Dynage and Gareth Jones, and we'll talk about their women in a moment. Carol Vaughan had already been mentioned, of course. But Fred had already done the original How series from 1966 to 1981. So he was a veteran of How already. And that's why the version we watched was called How To. And I didn't realise this at first. I was so confused as a child. The original How was so much outside my radar. And I thought, well, maybe it's a sort of play on words, like How To Do This and Do That. But when I watched it, I thought, well, this isn't a How To Do Every Time. Sometimes it's how this thing in history happened or how this scientific principle worked. And in the end, I asked our mum, and she was able to explain that there had been a programme called How Before, and I think I wanted to know, oh, was it the same thing? Did it have the same people? And she told me, well, just Fred Dynage. I remember thinking, surely they're on to more than the second series of this show by now. Shouldn't we be on to How 3, How 4? But no, they're all How 2. When it did finally come to an end in 2006, I found myself thinking, ah, well, the original started in 1966, so Fred actually ended up presenting How for 40 years, from his mid-twenties to his mid-sixties, with a nine-year gap during the eighties, which is pretty impressive. And despite the fact that he did an unduly cruel, cringy impression of Andy Crane, Fred Dynage was a wonderful presenter and taught us a lot of fantastic, interesting things in a very entertaining way, as did Gareth and the women. And it was on Crazy How Bad Attack that Fred came up with, or said to us, the phrase children's information programs to describe the four shows that were on Crazy How Bad Attack. And I thought, yes, that is a good way to describe them. They are edutaining. 
They are designed for children, therefore they are interesting, fun, children are going to enjoy watching them, but they also have plenty of information. You're going to learn from them, you're going to find them interesting and take something away from them that you can use in the wider world or help you engage with the wider world. It's like the TV executive on Mrs. Doubtfire says. Kids will enjoy it and they'll get some information too. And those are very good shows to have. And I thought, yes, children's information programs was a very good way to sum that up. And did we get a lot of good, useful, interesting information that we still use and remember from How To over those 16 years? Yes. I remember from how to why dogs pant and how you can't possibly have a hot cup of tea on the top of Mount Everest and how lunch was invented. Why is it uncomfortable to hold things for too long? Palms up because the bones in the lower arm, the radius and ulna, actually cross when you put your palms up. It made sense of a lot of things. Another one I remember, how crisps were invented, how stripy toothpaste was invented. I suppose young people now, some of them, not all of them, might turn their nose up at these things and say, well, who needs to know that? I suppose you don't need to know that, but it's very interesting, and it means you've got a good pool of general knowledge, which is always a good thing to have. We did used to particularly enjoy Fred and Gareth in some of their little role plays to explain things. Gareth calls Fred my naughty French brother. That made us laugh. They were telling us something about hot air and rising and smoke. I can't remember the details of this one, actually. Gareth wanted to know from Fred, why are you always ogging the fire? And then Fred didn't do the accent, I don't think, but explained that he wasn't hogging the fire. He was finding out this interesting scientific principle. They did used to sometimes dress up at least once per episode and go and do a little role play, recreate the circumstances under which lunch was invented and things like that. Sometimes they'd do one at the table where they would all sit round and do a little demonstration, maybe swap things round, try and figure out how to do the magic trick or whatever. And sometimes they'd do a sort of middling sized how where one of them would walk off and speak to somebody and get a little demonstration in another part of the studio. And I just use how as a noun there, which of course they did do. A segment explaining something was A, how. I think one of your favourite quotes is from Fred Dynage doing something about floating, putting 2p on the water or something, and he says, of course, it's our old friend, surface tension. I always think of Fred when there's anything going on involving surface tension, like if I accidentally fill a glass of water too full, and that end game on Fort Boyard Ultimate Challenge, where the cup sinks and you lose, and sometimes it's bobbing, and the water's like bulged up either side, I'm thinking, aha, uh -huh, that's our old friend, surface his tension. I seem to remember what Fred was doing. He was filling up a full glass with two peas and the water was coming over the top of the level of the glass and not spilling. I expect if I tried that the water would spill everywhere and surface tension wouldn't be my friend at all. A type of how they were doing towards the end, perhaps only in the final series in 2006, is where they would go outside the studio and look at something on the racetrack or whatever. And I thought that made it a bit too much like the Big Bang. I think that was the one thing the Big Bang did differently, sort of outside experiments. Rather like Four Part Attack, it was a bit of a desperate attempt to inject some new life or something different into the show towards the end, I think. Originally, up to 1996, I think, Carol Vorderman was the third presenter, the female presenter, and she used to do a lot of maths hows, as you might expect, and it was a shame that she left, really. I think while we were watching Crazy How Bad Attack, we were reminded, ah, oh, yes, it really feels like proper how to, and it spread Gareth and Carol. Well, you know, she must have enjoyed the show and got into the show, I thought, because she was calling out Neil Buchanan and the others for not actually answering their how. Ah, oh, but the original how was. And she seemed like she was very interested and very invested emotionally in the programme. But I think the reason that she left was because they suddenly started making three times as much countdown as ever before, didn't they? And it was the sensible decision, countdown, 
um, had more legs, probably more work, more money in it, and she was synonymous with Countdown more than with How To, I think. So it's a shame, but it's understandable. Yes, very much so. When they replaced Carol, there were obviously some big shoes to fill. First of all, it was Sean Lloyd, the weather forecaster, and she did a lot of howls about the weather. Perhaps that ran out of legs a bit quickly. I thought they were trying to replace Carol with someone who was really rather similar to Carol, somebody with an intellectual background, a scientific background more than a mathematical background, but they say maths is a type of science, don't they? I do find her a bit sort of forgettable. I don't think I found her as engaging as Carol, and I really don't know whether she left because she didn't want to do it anymore, she didn't like it, or because they agreed with me, thought she was forgettable, and they got rid of her. Yes, there was a series with Sean, and then a series with Gail Porter, who was very popular at the time. She was presenting quite a lot of children's things, but she was also in the news for being a bit naughty and wild and druggy and appearing scantily clad in the newspapers and things. So I don't know if she kind of outgrew the show after a series or they thought she wasn't really the best person to have on children's telly anymore. We had already seen her presenting It's a Mystery with Neil, hadn't we? It used to be Sophie Aldred, who we knew from words and pictures when we were very little. But they got rid of her, or she got rid of herself, and replaced her with Gail. And a man called Tristan Banks. And they did two series of It's a Mystery with Neil. And then there was a fourth series with Neil, and another young man and young woman presenter. And she's not really the same sort of thing as Carol Gordon, is she? She's not from an intellectual, sciencey background. She is from a TV background. And I seem to remember shortly after that seeing that she was going to present primetime shows. None that I think I ever watched, but I saw the trailers and things, and I thought, oh, Gail Porter was just using that as a stepping stone. Children's presenting onto primetime presenting like Ant and Deck, and I sort of assumed that was the reason she left, but perhaps it was also the producers of the show thinking she wasn't suitable. So then the last of the four women who was on the show to the end, must have done about six series like Carol, was Gail McKenna, who did have quite a bit of CITV presenting experience under her belt. She actually presented the successor to Animal Crazy, first of all with Terry Nutkins and Chris Packer, called Brilliant Creatures. After a while, they got rid of the two guys, and she stuck around presenting it with Stephen Mulhern, who was frightened of all the animals, which was very funny. And I watched that, and I used to enjoy that kind of thing in Animal Crazy, because one thing I liked even more than art was animals. So again, someone from a presenting background, someone that they knew and liked and had worked with on CITV. Not that she hadn't ever been on page three of the papers. She did a good job, and I think I enjoyed her more than either of the other two replacements for Carol. I do remember her starting to talk about something that had happened in history and saying, I sense a costume change coming on and making both the guys laugh. And she was the one presenting when they told me all about how lunch was invented and lunch wasn't really a thing, but men going to work would have a sandwich or something in the middle of the day and the wives were at expected to only have breakfast and dinner and then one of the men I can't remember which comes home and finds Gail in her historical costume all sort of lethargic and feeling sick and saying darling have you been having lunch again like it's the most unreasonable thing which is a very good example of how the show was edutaining the show really did need a good, suitable, long-term replacement for Carol. I think it would be fair to say it struggled to find it for a couple of series there. And then Gail McKenna was the right one and allowed the show to have a new lease of life and carry on for some more years. One thing that occurred to me while watching a couple of how-tos after I'd watched some art attacks on YouTube was if they were making this now, they wouldn't be able to introduce the show by all coming in, sitting down, holding up their palms and doing the Red Indian impression, greeting how. 
And of course, in 1966, when this was made up to introduce the show, it was a completely innocuous thing. Nobody would take offence to it at all. It's not meant to be offensive in any way, just evoking this traditionally red Indian greeting, which is probably vastly inaccurate, but we all knew what they were alluding to. And they were fine to keep doing that through the 90s and the early noughties. How? And that was a very big part of the show. But yeah, they couldn't do that now, could they? And, as I discovered, they can't and don't do that now. Because a reboot of How, simply entitled How, did air on CITV in the latter parts of 2020. And the first thing that struck me about it when I found the beginning of an episode was the three new young presenters all came in, sat down on their sofa, and just said into the ether, how? And I thought, well, that's a stupid way to start the show. They're not using it as a greeting. Obviously, you can't hold up your hand and go, how, oh, like the Red Indian, it would be offensive. But it would be better just not to say it at all. Just come in and sit down and don't say how. And it doesn't mean anything, does it? You just say it like that. Now, we've only watched one episode of this new How, which is more than enough. It was worse than I thought it would be, and you said the same thing. I thought it would probably be rather forced, a bit patronising, making desperate attempts to be cool, and it was all of those things magnified beyond belief, I thought. There are three presenters called Frankie, Sam and Vic, and they could be any genders, couldn't they? As it happens, Vic is a woman and Frankie and Sam are men. And I don't want to say anything against them personally as human beings. I don't want to blacklist them as individuals. It's the way that they are directed to present the show that's so objectionable. I thought that Frankie was the worst. I thought he couldn't sound convincing at all when he was going, oh, how cool, and when they were doing all the fake banter and things. I thought it was really quite painful. The other two were better, I thought, but the whole presentation style was just, well, cringe. They had to say the hub instead of the studio, which I thought was ridiculous. On the old house, they did used to do a bit of sort of fake banter and fake conversation just to introduce us to the house and have a bit of fun with it. And obviously they knew that we knew that it was fake and fun and they were mucking about, oh, well, Carol, I've got to bet you, Ted P, that this and the other won't happen. But in this new version of how, they sort of seem to be trying to make a kind of sitcom out of it. Much too much kind of bants fake conversation around the place. Oh, you haven't tied it up. Like, they haven't come to present the show, but it's a sort of flat share, and the situation leads into the how, whereas Fred and Gareth make no secret of the fact that they'd just come to sit at the table, present the show, and any kind of lead-in that they did that was scripted was sort of tongue-in-cheek, and it did feel much, much more natural. I mean, just about anything feels more natural than this bants that Vic and Frankie and Sam were attempting. So you can see where they got it from and why they thought it's how you do how, but they've also misunderstood it and taken it much too far. Which in many ways was a shame because in amongst all the cringe there was, like in the old shows, some interesting children's information about friction which they didn't present at all. They left it to this little girl ice skater to tell us about friction on ice. And the section Vic was doing about how they dispose of their rubbish on the International Space Station I thought was quite interesting and could have been presented very engagingly on a proper version of how. But it's just all tied up in very bad modern presentation, which was a shame. And what terrible use they did end up making of poor old Fred Dynage, now in his late seventies and confined to his house, partly because he's been shielding, and I found the news report where he said he was going to stop presenting the studio news and go home and shield, and obviously while he was doing this he was filming these segments for the new How, which is good to have him in it, but they don't make very good use of him. What was he setting up? Some sort of competition between three presenters where they would feel in the boxes. And I think that was 
was the point at which the three presenters were the least cringe, actually, when they were not saying scripted things, but feeling in the boxes and trying to guess what the things were and react to the hands reaching up and feeling them and stuff. But even if Fred hadn't been at home shielding, they probably might not have wanted to include him in the studio anyway and just give him this nominal God of How segment so we'll all think it's How. And if they had used that to make good use of him, we'd have nothing to complain about, but it does seem rather arbitrary and just ticking that box. So it remains to be seen if they'll make another series of that. But perhaps on the whole it would be better if they didn't. So there we are. That's how you do a podcast based around Art Attack and How To. And that's How, how For now. now. But do join us again next time, which will be the final Sunday in June, for a podcast on... Time Busters. A somewhat rare delve into the CBBC archives. Until then, good night out there. Whatever you are.